So now that I got that out of my system, I apologize if that grosses anybody out. Um, so let's talk about estoppel, uh, what that is, what the law books say it is. This is out of American Jurisprudence, the second edition, and the definition of estoppel. So I don't know if you guys know you can do this or not, but you can go, if you have Microsoft Word, you can right click on a word and you can go down here to synonyms and you can look up smart lookup and what this will do when you click on it is it'll pop up on the side here and it'll tell you okay if you see a word in here that you don't you know you don't know requisites or something elements whatever equitable okay and you can look over here and it'll tell you what a stopple is okay I didn't know if you guys knew you could do that but sometimes I do that when I come across a word that I don't know uh, because I do not like going past a word that I don't know so what is the definition of a stopple stopple is a collective name given to a group of legal doctrines in common law legal systems whereby a person is prevented from asserting certain matters before the court to prevent injustice. The person is said to be stopped. Okay, so basically, there's the word right there. They're stopped. Okay, stopple may operate by way of preventing someone from asserting a particular fact in court or exercising a certain right or from bringing a particular claim. Okay, so part of the administrative process that I did created an estoppel, okay? So let's go down here. Uh, one of the other things I want to show you too, is you see the little N1, the N2, okay? All of this information comes out of American jurisprudence is all from case law. Maurer versus T-Tex, Longer versus Knapp, okay? So whenever you see the N3, N4, N1, whatever, okay, this is all taken out of United States case law, okay? So didn't just make this up. It's come right out of the United States Supreme Court and, you know, the, the appellate courts and stuff. So let's, let, let's look at this. Silence that amounts to misrepresentation or concealment of facts can satisfy the conduct element of the test for equitable estoppel. Okay, that's what that's what you're in. Okay, child support, debt collection, it's all equity. Okay, it's all commerce. It all has to do with the money. Estoppel may arise by silence where one is under a duty to speak or act. Okay, so all these people that are ignoring you. Okay, uh, the administrative process. I think, uh, you know, it's my personal opinion. Everything that I've read says that this is the way to go because they do not have a claim, okay? So estoppel may arise by silence where one is under a duty to speak or act and the ensuing silence is wrongful and misleading. <laughs> Boy, does that sound like child support or what? Estoppel by silence or inaction is often referred to as estoppel by standing by, and that phrase is in connection, has almost lost its primary significance of actual presence or participation in the transaction or generally covers any silence where there are knowledge and a duty to make a disclosure. Okay, So when you're dealing with these people and they have a duty to respond to you and they don't, uh, I would highly suggest that you find out about the administrative process. If you want to contact me, uh, I'll leave an uh, email in the description. But the administrative process, we've been over it before. I've done videos. Uh, it seems to be um, something that has teeth. Okay. The rule is that a person who stands by and sees another about to commit or in the course of committing an act infringing on his or her rights and fails to assert his or her rights or title will be stopped 
from thereafter asserting them. Okay, and that goes both ways, by the way, too. If you don't bring it up, okay, if they ask you if you're the defendant and you say yes, then you don't have any rights. If you don't go in there and say, I reserve all my rights under UCC 1 308 and I am the holder in due course and I'm here as a third party intervener making special appearance as the authorized representative of the defendant, okay, and I'm not the defendant, I'm the, you know, I'm the secured party, I'm the, you know, holder in due course, I'm the authorized representative. You know, you have to ask, you know, there's a, something about threes, you got to do, you know, three times, you got to say it, um, then they got you, okay? But you got to assert your rights, you got to exercise your rights, and, and, you know, if you don't exercise them, you don't have them. So the principle underlying such estoppels is embodied in the maxim, maxim of law, one who is silent when he ought to speak will not be heard to speak when he ought to be silent, Okay? where the circumstances are such as to require a silent person to speak so that an injured person may take steps to protect himself or herself against a loss that might otherwise result when the former will be a stop from asserting the defense that he or she would have had but for his or her silence. Silence is where there is a duty to speak is deemed equivalent to concealment. Okay, so what do we got here? We got misleading, right? And we've got concealment. Okay, those are not good. Okay, so uh, like I was saying earlier, I didn't know what turpitude was, so I right-clicked on it and I looked it up, and it told me that it means wickedness, sinfulness, evil, and corruption. So on the other hand, mere silence or inaction is generally not a ground for estoppel unless there is a duty to speak or act. In other words, when you're dealing with these knuckleheads and you send them a document and you ask them for the contract and they ignore you and you write in there, you know what, let's take a look at something real quick. Okay? For instance, okay, this is my first letter, validation of debt letter, okay, to this ding-dong over at uh, the Office of State Debt Collection, okay, and it says, according to the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, 1692G, okay, you have a duty to provide me with documents that show proof of your claim and that I owe your agency and that we are in contract, right? It also states you must cease and desist collection activities until you validate this alleged debt. Okay, now let's go see what the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act says. Okay, and once again, this isn't legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, you know, whatever, the, you know, all that stuff. You know, this is all, you know, do your own research. Be your own, you know, conspiracy theorist. You know, look it up. Read it. Okay. So this is 1692G, okay? What is this I'm looking at right here? This is, let's go to the top here so you can see where I'm at, okay? This is Consumer Law Center, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, okay? As amended, blah, blah, blah. And we go down here to 809. Where's 809? There it is right there, validation of debt. So, okay, got 803 definitions, okay? Here's 804. Location information, 806, harassment, 807, false or misleading representations. <laughs> Boy, they, they might be in there too. Okay. And you go down here to, whoop, there's unfair practices. Okay, it all it's all right here. Okay, you just got to read it. Here's validation of debt. Okay. Within five days, blah, 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 blah. Okay, send the consumer a written notice containing the amount of the debt, the name of the creditor, okay, a statement that unless the consumer within 30 days, remember that one that I showed you, it says on the back of the paper, 30 days after receipt, they will assume that the, uh, the debt to be valid, okay? Now, a statement that if the consumer notifies the debt collector in writing within 30-day period, okay, that any portion thereof is disputed, the debt collector will obtain verification of the debt or a copy of the judgment against the consumer 
and it will be mailed. Okay? Okay. So that's where I got this guy. If the consumer notifies a debt collector in writing within 30 day parameters described in subsection A, okay? Whereas A within five days, unless following information containing the initial communication. Okay, okay, so it wasn't in there. It just says, hey, you owe us. Um, uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. Okay. So that the debt or any portion thereof is disputed or that the consumer requests the name and address of the original creditor, the debt collector shall cease collection of the debt or any disputed portion thereof until the debt collector obtains verification of the debt or any copy of or any copy of the judgment or the name and address of the original creditor okay so there it is right there that's where i got it and uh let's see let's go back here okay so what did i say in this notice it says it also states you must cease and desist collection activities well <laughs> i didn't just make that up until you validate the alleged debt, I would happy to be set. I would happy. I would be happy to settle any financial obligation I might lawfully owe. What is that? That's no dispute right there. Okay, that means I do not dispute. However, I want to see the following documentation: validation of alleged debt, the actual accounting showing a loss. Okay, well, I don't have that. Verification of your claim against me, either a sworn affidavit or a hand signed invoice. Of course, they're not going to put their name to anything. A copy of the contract, right? Signed by both parties and therefore binding both parties. Of course, they don't have that either. Okay? And then please provide me with a true and certified copy of all paperwork you have from the Department of Corrections, Adult Probation and Parole, Third District Court, or whomever is the original creditor. Okay? So you can't argue with this, man. This is their law. Okay. So... Okay, getting a little excited, sorry. So, it's their law. And these debt collection agencies that work for the state, okay, Child Support, Office of Recovery Services, you know, Office of Child Enforcement, Child Support Enforcement Agencies, okay, they all work for the state, and they are bound by federal law. And if it's a debt, right, it's child support debt, then show me the contract. That's all I want to see. Just show me the contract. And when I send you a uh, piece of paper in the mail, uh, you have a duty to respond. On the other hand, mere silence or inaction is generally not a ground for estoppel unless there is a duty to speak or act, right? So I want to see the documents that show the original creditor. Who's the creditor, right? Estoppel is a bar to the assertion of a claim may not be invoked by a party to whom no duty to speak is owed. So, do they have a duty to speak to you? Yes. Do they have a duty to show you where you're contractually bound? Right? Do, do they have a judgment? Well, sure, they have a judgment, but the judgment is against the defendant. Who's the defendant? Your all cap name. Right? There must be some element of turpitude, okay, corruption or negligence connected with the silence or inaction by which the other party is misled to his or her injury. Have you been injured by these people? You're damn right you have. In other words, to give rise to an estoppel by silence, there must be a right and an opportunity to speak and in addition, an obligation or duty to do so, right? So, and then we're going to skip the next one because they start talking about stuff that doesn't um, apply. Okay, and here we go. The mere fact that another may act to his or her prejudice if the true state of things is not disclosed, right, obviously, does not render silence culpable, which means responsible, answerable, liable, or accountable, or make it operate operate as an estoppel against one who owes no duty of active diligence to protect the other party from injury. So, in other words, we're talking about third parties. We're, you know, you're talking about the secretary in the front office, okay? You're, you're talking about the, you know, forklift driver uh, that's loading trucks on the back, you know. Uh, these people aren't liable, okay? They're not culpable, okay? But that knucklehead 
that stints, you know, sitting up on the on the on the bench, you know, that calls himself an administrative law judge and works for the state and whose only job is to engorge the state treasury, right? He's the one that's liable. Okay? So there's no actual obligation to disclose matters of which the other party has actual or constructive knowledge or has to which the information or means of acquiring information of the two parties is equal. Generally, a person is required to speak only when common honesty, and here's the great one, fair dealing demand that he or she must do so. And in order that a party may be a stop by silence, there must be on his or her part an intent to mislead. Huh? That's nice. I like that. So that sounds like a stopple. Or at least a willingness that others should be deceived together with knowledge or reason to suppose that someone is relying on such silence or inaction and in consequence thereof is acting or is about to act as he or she would not act otherwise. Thus, to work an estoppel, silence must amount to bad faith. Okay, now let's remember back to my bill in equity, clean hands and in good faith, right? That's where you want to come with, clean hands and good faith. So this stuff up here is about mortgages and stuff. We're not talking about those right now, but this is kind of nice. The courts are especially disposed, which means inclined or willing to uphold a claim of estoppel by silence or inaction, where one party with full knowledge of the facts has stood by without asserting his or her rights or raising any objection while the other party, acting on the faith of such apparent acquiescence, which means silence, which means you're doing nothing, incurred large expenditures that will be wholly or partially lost if such rights or objections are sub subsequently given effect, okay? And once again, all of this stuff is taken right out of the case law, okay? So, silence by acquiescence, tacit procreation, um, estoppel, okay? This might be something you want to look into. Peace.